We are living, gang, in, I believe, the most exciting time in all of history right now. And it's not because of the inauguration that's about to happen this week. We are living right now in the most exciting time because there are things happening all around us of huge prophetic significance that have never happened since the day they were spoken. And we're going to look at some of those today. But I want you to remember that when it's all said and done, that the church does not go through wrath. God is not destined us for wrath, but for salvation, Paul writes, Ephesians chapter 5. The church will be saved. And to be part of that, it doesn't take membership. As I pointed out before, the church directory is just a directory of names and phone numbers and addresses so you can get a hold of each other and so we can deepen our fellowship. It is not a membership directory because our membership is in a larger church body. And that's the church that God puts together when we confess faith in Jesus Christ. And that church, that's, that's the key, gang. God's grace through Jesus' blood and our faith. Our faith. It's what makes this age of people different than any other. It's what makes up the church. It's faith. Jesus says, blessed are you who believe and have not seen. I've never seen Jesus, not in the flesh. But I know Him and I believe in Him as my Lord and my Savior. And because I've confessed faith in Him, guess what? I get to be a spotless bride. I know that freaks some of you out, but this is the truth. As as part of the church. So that's where we're headed. And if you're not part of the church, I'm not asking you or inviting you to place membership this morning. What I am asking you and inviting you to do is to confess Jesus Christ as Lord today. And you, from this point forward, are part of that saved group of people who believe without seeing, who trusted without the proof. Although, as we're going to see this morning, the proof is all over the place. We're in Matthew 16. And rolling through the Gospel of Matthew, this has been uh, one of my all-time favorite studies that we've done of all the books that we've gone through so far. I know I've said that about every book, but hey, I'm in Matthew right now. (laughs) And in verse 1 of chapter 16, we're told the Pharisees and the Sadducees came up and testing Jesus, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. They're always asking for a sign. This is not the first time. They've asked many times before. They're asking for a messianic sign. They want some fantastic display in the heavens to prove that Jesus is who he claimed to be. And he replied to them, verse 2, When it's evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, there will be a storm today, for the sky is red and threatening. Do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky but cannot discern the signs of the times. I always think of Jeff D'Angelo when I read that verse. I do, Jeff, because he's a nut about the weather. I mean, he is like a wife. If you ever want to know what the weather's going to be for the next 10 days, call Jeff. Because he knows. It's an up-to-minute you know, analysis. When the snow was coming, I mean, like every half hour, my phone would ring. I think it's going to snow in about five minutes now. Okay, thanks a lot, Jeff. You know. <laughs> Jesus says, do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but cannot discern the signs of the times? An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. And a sign will not be given it except the sign of Jonah. Now, there have been plenty of signs, gang. Where Jesus was born, the circumstances surrounding his birth, the miracles that he had, that he had done, the teaching, the whole expression of who Jesus is and was. The signs were there. They were asking for something else. And he says, therefore your hearts are adulterous. You're not looking at what's right in front of you. He says, it will not be given. A sign won't be given except the sign of Jonah. He said, Pharisees, Sadducees, you get one more. One more sign and that's it. It will be my death, burial, and resurrection. And if you don't believe then, that's it. And he left them and he went away. But the disciples, verse 8, came to the other side of the sea. Now they're, they're crossing the Galilee. They come to the eastern uh, shore of the Galilee. But they had forgotten to bring any bread. Which would be a crisis because there really weren't very many Burger Kings and McDonald's on the eastern shore. Okay, those were all on the western shore. So they're on the east side. They don't have anywhere to get bread. And Jesus said, watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they began to discuss this among themselves saying... Oh, he said that because we didn't bring any bread. I love the apostles because they just remind me of us. 
You know, Jesus does some fantastic thing or he makes some really insightful uh, teaching into our hearts and we go, what? Is he talking about sandwiches? I don't get it, Lord. (laughs) But Jesus, aware of this, most patient man who ever lived, said, you men of little faith, why do you discuss among yourselves that you have no bread? Do you not understand or remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets full you picked up? And they're thinking, let's see, how many was that, Peter? I don't remember, but I know it was a lot. Okay. Or how about the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many large baskets full you picked up? Now, he's reminding him of these things to remind them, hey, we're going to the Eastern Shore, but if I could feed all those people, are you really worried about lunch? It's on me. Okay, I got it. <laughs> How is it, he says, verse 11, that you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread, but beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they understood that he did not say to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Father, we are aware, I am aware today that there is all kinds of leaven in the world. And leaven, that picture, Lord, you used again and again as a picture of evil seeping in and spreading out. Father, it unnerves me because I see leaven in the very church that we just talked about as spotless and perfect. And so, Lord, I pray that you will enlighten our eyes to only the teaching of Jesus Christ. That we would not be infected or invaded Or impeded, Lord, by the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the the leaven of false doctrine, but that we would know the truth. And live by the truth and and be guided by your word and by your spirit. And so this morning, as we talk about these things, Lord, I invite your Holy Spirit to be our teacher. And to get the rest of us out of the way, just so that we can sit at your feet, all of us together as a family, brothers and sisters, kids at the feet of our Father, and listen to your teaching. And I pray you'll give us insight and help us to be people who see the signs of the times, who do discern, who do understand. And fathers, we see all these things. I pray Jesus, come quickly. In Jesus' name, amen. Who would have guessed that 2008 would have begun with such incredible turbulence, or ended, actually, with such turbulence? I mean, it began... Pretty good. The war in Iraq was was going better. You know, the the surge. People were saying, it's it's working. It's a good thing. President Bush turned his attention to the Middle East, as most presidents tend to do, I think, during their last few years in office. The, The country looks at them as a lame duck, so they figure they'll try and have some influence somewhere else. And the year began pretty all right. And it ended in a way that I think none of us expected. The financial collapse... Worldwide, Israel at war again. So many problems and issues. And it was, it was what Barack Obama rode his entire campaign on to great success. We are in dangerous parallel times. We need change. And I'll tell you what this man has. It's a voice of leadership. He has the ability to capture the imagination of people and to cast vision. And people grabbed on. And are hoping beyond hope that this man in the White House is going to bring the change that America needs. No offense to any Democrats among us, but Barack Obama is not the Messiah. George Bush was not the Messiah either, Republicans among us. No man sitting in the White House is ever going to bring what needs to be brought to the world. There's only one leader, one ruler, one king, and that's Jesus Christ. When he comes, it's going to be good, and I will ride that train. (laughs) <laughs> David um, came into strength and Saul's power was waning in Israel and as that happened it, it's interesting large numbers of people began to come to David and his mighty men they're in a place called Ziklag and as they gathered in we have in First Chronicles a, a detail of all the people of Israel by tribe by tribe of who came to David and how many it were who confessed and professed loyalty to him to stand with him in the changing of the guard. And First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32, it's a, it's a verse to take note of. It says of the sons of Issachar, men who understood the times with knowledge of what Israel should do. 
Their chiefs were 200. Check that out. Men who understood the times. There were 200 of them, of the tribe of Issachar in Israel, who gathered to David. What a moniker to have on your name. One who understands the times, a discerner of current events. Someone whose eyes are open and who is aware of what's happening. And that's what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 16. The signs of the times. You Pharisees can look at the weather and figure out what's coming. And you can't see what's happening all around you? You're not aware of the signs of the times? And they ask again for this messianic sign from heaven. And this time, actually, the Pharisees have reached across the aisle. In unusual bipartisan fashion, they grab the the Sadducees. And they bring them together. And these guys come to Jesus, <laughs> and, and they ask him for the sign. And, and the problem of the Pharisees and all their self-styled righteousness, and the Sadducees and their wholesale rejection of supernatural things, is that they were not up to speed on biblical prophecy. Had they been, they would have seen Jesus. They knew he was born in Bethlehem. Micah said he would be. They knew that he was from Nazareth. Biblical prophecy, Jeremiah said he would be a branch, a netzer, a Nazarene. They knew the Bible said he was going to somehow come out of Egypt. Jesus had gone down into Egypt and been brought out to be hidden from Herod. All these things, and I could, I could begin recounting all the proofs of Jesus' Messiahship before he even started his ministry and teaching were right there for anybody to see. If you knew the Hebrew Scriptures, if you were reading and up on current events and what the word has to say about them and so Jesus points them to the heavens once again and says take a look at this if you can do that can't you open your eyes to the time, to the signs all around you I'm sharing this game because though Jesus spoke these words of warning 2,000 years ago there is a red sky at morning there is a red sky in the morning today and the storm is coming and the storm is nearer now than it has ever been And we are at a place, a crossroads, literally in history, where something fantastic is about to occur. Possibly even before I'm done this morning, so some of you can relax. We're very close. We're very close. Columnist Tom Krattenmaker uh, wrote in December of Useless Today newspaper. He said, The end times seem to be looming... At all times. This whole article, it was interesting, was about the echopocalypse. That now it's not just Christians who see an end time scenario, but it's, it's people who are green. You know, it's the environmentalists. And they're beginning to talk about all these world events. Global warming, the whole global warming agenda. We've got to do something now because the, the world's going to destroy itself. And our carbon emissions... Rick, just your emissions alone during your teaching this morning, you should have to be taxed for. I mean, this is bad news. The echopocalypse, and it is interesting. In all circles, even outside of Christianity, people are nervous about the end. Now, this this columnist wrote, the end times seem to be looming at all times, to kind of put a tongue-in-cheek jab at Christians. You guys are always talking about the end times. (laughs) It's getting old, really. Left behind came out, what, a decade ago? Leave it behind, man. Move on. Gang, some would argue that Christians have been talking about the coming of Jesus for 2,000 years and nothing's really changed. I think Peter wrote something about that. Mockers will come in their mocking, he says, saying, where's the sign of his coming? Everything remains just as it has been since the days of Noah. Of course, they miss the fact that a flood came right after that. Yes, the church has always looked to the coming of Christ, but the literal interpretation of Scripture, the book of Revelation playing out as written, has only come into play literally in this past century, since about the mid-1800s. Do you realize that in the church, from about 300 forward for a thousand years, the idea of the rapture, that is the church being caught up, and the book of Revelation being a literal book of prophecy, was mostly ignored in the church? For a thousand years, why? Because the church got in bed with Rome. Because religion and government got married. And what the Bible calls, indicates, was an objectionable marriage. And that marriage continued on, and people in the church began to say, well, Israel's out of the land, so any Bible prophecy about Israel or the temple or Jerusalem, that's got to be bogus, or at least allegorical. It's got to be a metaphor, because Israel's not there. 
all the way up until a certain point in history. For a thousand years, people did not have the patience to accept the Word of God as literal and true. We're in an interesting place now because we can see some things. I'm going to give you a prophecy update this morning. What I mean by prophecy update, if you haven't been with us before, and it's been a little while, we didn't do one in 2008. I've been doing a lot of watching and tucking aside notes and trying to see what's going on. But a prophecy update is simply saying what's happening right now in the world, and does Scripture speak to it? Is there literal fulfillment of biblical prophecy going on around us? Now, when you wade into this area, you've got to be careful that you're looking at Scripture in context. We're going to do that today. But I want to show you something that I believe dials us into exactly. It was something the prophets wrote about that has happened in the last three years, and specifically right now, that I think will give some more evidence of where we stand on the whole timeline of history. I've got a lot of things, actually. I had to uh, set aside some notes for next week. We're going to do this in two parts, maybe three. I don't know. Okay, maybe nine. But there's so much (laughs) out there to talk about. There's so much biblical prophecy, and there are several things we're going to deal with next week. I'll give you a little teaser. We're going to talk about Antichrist next week because there have been a lot of questions raised by people about Antichrist. No, I don't believe he's the American president. Okay, let's just get this right out on the table. But there's a lot of information that the Bible gives us about Antichrist. There's information the Bible gives us about the sleeping bear that is now awake, Russia. A lot of information the Bible gives us about the European Union and how all these things play into end-time scenario. There may even be some things in there about the United States. We'll we'll wait and look at that next week. But this morning, I just want to deal with the biggest sign of the previous and continuing on into this generation, the biggest sign of the times. And it's the rebirth of, the, of Israel as a nation. Well, Rick, you've talked a lot about that. I'm going to talk about it again, so get comfy. Matthew 24, verse 32. Jesus said, learn the parable from the fig tree. He said, when the branch has already become tender and put forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So you too, when you see all these things, recognize he is near at the door. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. That's a pretty powerful statement made there in Matthew 24. That when this this symbol, this picture, this this type, this fig tree, Jesus says a parable for something else. Keep your eyes open. When the fig tree blossoms, summer is near. Throughout the Bible, the fig tree is a representation of Israel. If you look throughout the Old Testament time and time again, you will see Israel referred to as a fig tree, compared to a fig tree. And I absolutely believe that Jesus is referring to Israel right here. When you see the blossoming of the fig tree. Now, had Jesus said in Matthew 24 at that moment, learn the parable of Israel when it comes back as a nation again, it it wouldn't have made sense because at that point at least, Israel was still a nation. It would be for another 35, 40 years until it was destroyed in A.D. 70. Titus and the legions of Rome destroyed Jerusalem. They murdered, they drove out vast numbers of Jewish people. By AD 135, the emperor, Roman emperor Hadrian, he came in and actually started off friendly with the Jewish people until there was an uprising led by a man named Shimon Bar Kokhba. The Bar Bar Kokhba rebellion was a three-year rebellion, which, by the way, is a fascinating history. I hadn't even realized until I dug into a little bit how far those Israelites at the time, the people of Judah in 135, actually went in reclaiming so much of the land before Hadrian put it down. And it was brutal. And he was done. Rome was done with the Jews at that point. They left only those sick and elderly in Jerusalem with this rule. You have the death penalty if two Jews meet and talk in the streets of Jerusalem. And he did many things that that damaged the land, trying to take apart the nation of Israel. He even renamed Israel Philistine land. Palestinia. The the, the Roman language, I believe if I'm right about this, doesn't have the the F sound, the PH sound put together. And so, Palestinia, Philistine land, is what it meant. It was a slap in the face of Judaism worldwide. We're going to rename your land by your former worst enemies, the Philistines. Israel remained Philistine land, although no Philistines existed in it, for the next 1,838 years. And so, students of Bible prophecy and people who read the Bible would say... Boy, when God says He's going to do something with Israel, Israel's toast. There's no Israel for Him to work with. So there must be some... The church is Israel. (laughs) 
I have one thing to say about that. Thanks for playing. Next. It's replacement theology. It's a whole other talk for another time. It's bogus. It is not biblical. May 14th, 1948. The biggest day on the calendar, as far as I'm concerned, in the 20th century. Like a fig tree that's been dormant through long winter months, suddenly Israel was reborn. A nation born in a day. Emerging as a nation again under incredible odds. Just having come out of the Holocaust, which destroyed, murdered, massacred six million Jews. A nation for the Jews was born in a day. Isaiah wrote, Isaiah 66, verse 8, Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Can a land be born in a day? Can a nation be brought forth all at once? As soon as Zion travailed and has went through pain, anguish, as in childbirth, which is a picture there of the Holocaust, she also brought forth her sons. Shall I bring to the point of birth and not give delivery, says the Lord? Or shall I, who gives delivery, shut the womb, says your God? Now, again, some might say, I've heard this, Rick, and I know, but you cannot talk about modern biblical prophecy without talking about Israel. You've got to keep your eyes focused on that tiny postage stamp of a country the size of New Jersey. Keep your eyes focused on there in the Middle East. Because so much of what's going on prophetically and being fulfilled is being fulfilled before our very eyes right there. That's why I want to take you back there. That's why I invite you again. March 2010, if we be still here, (laughs) go to Israel and see for yourself what's going on. By the way, 1948 was not just the rebirth of Israel. That was a huge year on the prophetic calendar all the way around. The European Union was formed and born in 1948. We'll talk more about that next week. The World Council of Churches, the first attempt at a unified global religious body, began in 1948. The invention of the transistor. What's the big deal there? It's the component. It is the key of all of our technology today. And it was invented in 1948. In-N-Out Burger started in 1948. (laughs) Which is cool. And it explains why if you take one of their little cups, I don't know if you know, obviously by your reaction, a lot of you know In-N-Out. Best hamburger place in California. But if you look under the cup, is it in the world? Okay. It says, well, we don't have any in Washington, though. It's really wrong. Yeah. So if you happen to be in California and about to get on a plane, I'll wait the two hours. Give me a burger. I want the double and the fries and their shake. And just ask the stewardess to stick it in the freezer or something for me. Anyway, I I digress. Until the rebirth of Israel in 1948, Bible students and scholars had to spiritualize and explain away everything that had to do with Israel. Aside from some men who I have the greatest respect for, men like Sir Robert Anderson, who wrote a book called The Coming Prince, one of the best books on Antichrist that's out there. He wrote it in the 1800s. Anderson wrote this book assuming the presence of Israel in the land when their presence in the land was impossible. Why would he do that? The Bible said so. Because Scripture was clear about it. Because he believed the Lord and took him at his word. It's interesting to me, every mention of Israel present in the land had to either be allegorical for the church, that is replacement theology, or had to be revoked completely because of Israel's failure to keep God's covenant. At least according to people who just didn't believe the word for what it was saying. And yet Paul writes in Romans 11:28, from the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your state, sake, talking about the Jews. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. And that verse alone should have told people down through the years that God is not through with the Jew. God is going to do something with Israel. We don't understand. We don't get it. We don't see it now. But he's going to. Hey, gang, we see it now. We see a nation of people that should not be here. We see a language revived that should not have been revived. A man by the name of Ben Yehuda t- takes his family back to Israel and says to his kids, this is the last word in English you're going to hear me speak, and started speaking Hebrew, which he had studied out to figure out how to speak. And from that, that was the birth of that, the rebirth of the language. It's never happened before. Never in the history of the world has a people group been driven out of a country and destroyed and come back in to a full nation status speaking the original language. Unheard of. 
Well, unless you read Bible prophecy. And then it was spoken of very clearly. God never wants us to be surprised it's all right here for us. People would say the future mention of the temple in Revelation has to be explained as metaphorical. Because obviously there's no temple on the Temple Mount today, right? So it's got to be a metaphor. Well, you know what? If you're listening to what we're talking about here, there's going to be a temple on the Temple Mount. Has to be. Why? Because the Word says so. Okay. Boy, you really take this stuff literally. Yes, I do. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 2 says, Behold, I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling to all the peoples around. And when the siege is against Jerusalem, it will also be against Judah. It will come about in that day. I'll make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who lift it will be, listen to this, will be severely injured. One year ago, President Bush stood up and made this announcement. Early January, he said, By the end of my term, we are going to press for and have a two-state solution in the Middle East. Israel and Palestine living side by side. This is the goal of my administration. I put my reputation on it. What happened to the reputation of President Bush in this last term of office? I'll tell you what. Be careful saying you're going to do something to Israel other than what God wants done. Jerusalem is a cup that causes reeling. Every American president, straight down the line from Jimmy Carter forward, who has tried to do something with Israel, has been hurt by it. And has failed miserably. And there is no legacy there for President Bush now. Barack Obama has stated on his first day of office that he is going to send an envoy of crack political minds and diplomats to fix the problem. Day one of his administration, this is a high priority. I think I'm just going to email him Zechariah 12. (laughs) Be careful, man. If you want to do anything with Israel, I highly encourage that you do what the Word says God wants to do. (laughs) By the end of his term, there would be a two-state solution. His term ends this week. Have we even moved an inch closer to peace in the Middle East? As we are here this morning, for the past 26 days, the eyes of the world have been drawn again to Israel. More specifically, to a strip of land 25 miles long, 7 miles wide at the widest, down to 2 to 4 miles at the most narrow. It would be like, like Oak Harbor to Coopville, north end of Whidbey Island down to Coopville. It's called the Gaza Strip. 1.5 million people reside there. Boy, I think what that would do to our rural setting here on (laughs) North Whidbey Island. That's the Gaza Strip, and Israel is back there, and we've been watching it, and we've been watching the war going on, and and Israel going back in, trying to stop the rockets that have been flying from Hamas. And it brings me to an even more immediate point of prophetic significance than the rebirth of Israel some 60 years ago, 61 years now this year. And that is, and if you're noting these things, the rebirth of Israel, the rejection of Gaza. The rejection of Gaza. This, this became clear to me this week in such a way that I had to back off all the other property. I, I wasn't going to talk about this. But it's so significant and so relevant. Let's think about Gaza just for a moment. The, the borders of Gaza were originally drawn as part of a 1950 armistice agreement between Israel, not the Palestinians, but between Israel and Egypt. Gaza was the buffer zone between these two nations. And an armistice was signed, and it was mostly Egyptian-occupied until 1967, when Israel gained sovereignty over the region after the Six-Day War. So Gaza fell back into the hands of the people of Israel. By 1972, in Netzarim in Gaza, a military outpost was established by Israel, again, as a buffer zone of protection against Egypt. For 33 years, Gaza has been an unstable but necessary buffer zone, increasingly occupied by a group of people you know of, call themselves the Palestinians, claiming it's their ancient right. It's their ancient homeland. The people who are called Palestinians today claim to be Philistines. They say, we are the Philistines of old. We are the ancient enemy of Israel. Why do they claim that? Because... They claim the Philistines came into the land before Israel did. And so their right precedes Israel's right to be there. Joan Peters in her book, From Time Immemorial, I've shared this before, but let's be clear, said the Philistines were an Aegean people. 
driven out of Greece and the Aegean Islands around 1,300 years before Christ. They moved southward along the Asiatic coast. They were a, a fishing and, and sailing type people. And in about 1200 B.C., they tried to invade Egypt. They were turned back and they ended up settling in the maritime plain of southern Judah where they founded a series of city-states, Gaza, the Gaza Strip. So originally it was Philistine country. But it's interesting to me, and I point this out because the Palestinians of today have chosen to align themselves with the Philistines, to say we are the Philistines. Now they're not. Palestinians are Arabic. The Philistines were European. Totally different people group, so they can't be. But, but, and don't miss this, they have claimed the name. These are our people. We are the Philistines of old. This is where they stand. This is the, you know, the statement of the Palestinian. I wonder if God is going to accept that as the case. Hold that thought. In 2005, something happened. We talked about it at the time, but I had no idea of the prophetic significance of it until now. In 2005, Israel unilaterally pulled out of Gaza. They had sovereignty over it. They had control. But you know, the mess, the problems, the constant warring, and Israel having the the constant incursions into Palestinian territories within Gaza. So Israel finally, under Ariel Sharon, said, we're out of here. It was a show of good faith on the part of uh, Ariel Sharon. Gaza pulled out as a political move to show the world we're willing to give up land for peace. Now, there were voices inside Israel One, Benjamin Netanyahu, who is seeking to be Israel's new prime minister, and it may happen in February. He was a voice saying, if we pull out, it's going to become Hamistan, which is exactly what happened. It became a hotbed of terror. 6,000 missiles fired out of Gaza over the last three years alone into Israel territory. Into towns like Esteroth and Yad Mordecai and Ashkelon and Ashdod. And if those names sound familiar, it's because they are in Scripture, gang. So one of the amazing things about being in the country of Israel is you begin to look around at roadsides and realize they're still called what they were called 4,000 years ago. These places are still here. It's incredible. Israeli children living right now in bomb shelters in those cities. Parents, can you imagine that? You tuck your son or daughter into bed at night on a, on a three-tiered bunk bed on a wall in a bomb shelter. Kids get 10, maybe 20 minutes outside to play during each day. And then back into the shelter. They're schooled in the shelter. They eat in the shelter. They're cared for in the bomb shelter. These are how these kids are growing up and have been for three years. While the world goes, oh, it's cool. You know, it's just a few missiles. Well, what if it was your town? So Israel goes back in to Gaza. But here's the critical thing to understand. When they pulled out, leaving behind considerable agricultural, commercial, and residential assets... When they pulled out, and and the Palestinians there absolutely destroyed everything they left. In fact, back in 2005, September 19th, the Jerusalem report said in just one week, 33 years of Jewish settlements have been reduced to 21 heaps of rubble. They pull out, and the withdrawal and the closing of these Jewish settlements, gang, in so doing, Israel abandoned Gaza. They abandoned Gaza. But their rejection of Gaza has done far more than than bring a reigning terror of missiles into Israel. Amos chapter 1 verse 6, thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Gaza, and for four I will not revoke its punishment, because they deported an entire population to deliver it up to Edom. They deported a population. Who deported the Jewish people out of Gaza? The Jewish people. Israel, the government, chose To abandon Gaza. How does God feel about that? What's God's perspective on the Gaza Strip? Joshua 15, verse 20, tells us this is the inheritance of the tribe of the sons of Judah according to their families. And for the next 20 verses in Joshua 15, it goes town by town listing all of the territory given to Judah by God. You get down to verse 45 of Joshua 15, and the name is Ekron, a city today. With its towns and villages, from Ekron even to the sea, all that were by the side of Ashdod, 
city today, with their villages. Ashdod, its towns and its villages. Gaza, its towns and its villages. As far as the brook of Egypt and the Great Sea, even its coastline, God gave Gaza to Israel. When Joshua and the people first came in, God said, this is part of your allotment of land. This belongs to you. It is yours, Israel. But Israel in 2005 abandoned Gaza, and in the three, fa- three years since their leaving, have had nothing but heartache and pain and misery from it, such that now they have to go back in, and now the war has started all back up, and it's a mess over there. And have you noticed the world opinion about Israel right now? Does the Lord have an opinion? Obadiah chapter 1 verse 10. Some of you Bible students will remember this. But it's very interesting to me. It says, because of violence done to your brother Jacob. And by the way, the Arabs and the Jews are of the same family line. They're Shemites. They all track back to... Wait a minute. Yeah, Shem. So they are brothers. Which is, makes the whole enmity and hatred there even more interesting. Because of violence done to your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame, and you will be cut off forever. And the Hebrew word for violence there is Hamas. Interesting. Turn in your Bibles now to Zephaniah. This is the prophecy I want you to see this morning. Zephaniah chapter 2. Now, I want to allow for you to take issue with me on this. Not this morning. I'm not going to take any questions. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm going to allow for you to take issue with me on this just by saying please go home and read this and think about it and study it in context because I have labored over this one this week but I think the context tells us exactly what I'm about to share Zephaniah chapter 2 verse 1 Zephaniah chapter 2 verse 1 Gather yourselves together. Yes, gather, O nation, without shame. Before the decree takes effect, the day passes like the chaff. Before the burning of the anger of the Lord comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you, seek the Lord. All you, humble of the earth, who have carried out His ordinances, seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. Now watch this. Verse 4. For Gaza will be abandoned. Ashkelon, a desolation. Ashdod will be driven out at noon, and Ekron will be uprooted. Woe to the inhabitants of the seacoast, the nation of the Karathites. The Karathites, or Cherethites, however you want to pronounce that, were the Philistines. Okay, these were Philistine people. The next verse tells us, The word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan, land of the Philistines, and I will destroy you, so that there will be no inhabitant. So the seacoast will be pastures with caves for shepherds and folds, flocks. And the coast will be for the remnant of the house of Judah. They will pasture on it. In the houses of Ashkelon, they will lie down at evening. Notice, not in the bomb shelters. In the houses of Ashkelon, they will lie down at evening. For the Lord their God will care for them and restore their fortune. When Zephaniah wrote this prophecy, it had already happened, in part. That is, the Philistines driven out of the land. The Philistines were were gone. And Zephaniah steps up and begins to speak these words about the driving out. About God being against the land of the Philistines. And and against the the Karatites, the the Philistines. Not the Karatops, the (laughs) Karatites. This had already happened in part. For for Judah and ancient Philistia, this was a done deal. Zephaniah wrote at the time of King Josiah. So you'd almost say, oh, well, so he's just kind of restating what happened. Gang, it is very clear that the book of Zephaniah is a prophecy. It is a book of future comings, of future happenings. And watch this. Go back to chapter 1, because the context of this prophecy about Gaza is that it will happen right before the day of the Lord. Watch this. Chapter 1, verse 14. Near is the great day of the Lord. Near and coming very quickly. Listen, the day of the Lord. In it the warrior cries out bitterly. A day of wrath is that day. A day of trouble and distress. A day of destruction and desolation. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and thick darkness. A day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities and the high corner towers. 
I will bring distress on men so they will walk like the blind because they sinned against the Lord. And their blood will be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. And some might say, oh, well, he's talking about the, the imminency of the coming of Babylon to destroy Israel. That, that must be what he's talking about there. Not so. Read on. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to deliver them on the day of the Lord's wrath. And all the earth will be devoured in the fire of his jealousy. For he will make a complete end, indeed a terrifying one, of all the inhabitants of the earth. Not just the destruction that happened when Babylon took Israel. Not the destruction that happened in AD 70 when Rome kicked out the Jews. A destruction, a complete destruction of the whole earth. What Zephaniah is talking about there, gang, is called the day of the Lord. Jeremiah calls it the day of Jacob's trouble. It's listed, mentioned, I believe, there in Daniel's 70th week. Joel and Zephaniah call it the day of the Lord. They're all speaking of that event that Jesus called the tribulation. The day of the Lord. When God pours out his wrath on a world that has rejected Christ. The day of the Lord. So keeping in context, go back to verse 1 of chapter 2 and listen again. Gather yourselves together. Yes, gather, O nation, without shame before the decree takes place. Before this happens, the day passes like chaff. Before the burning of the anger of the Lord comes upon you. Before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you. And then he gives this trigger point, I believe. This sign of the times. Verse 4, Gaza will be abandoned. And the way Zephaniah writes this, if I'm not mistaken, Gaza will be abandoned just before the day of the Lord begins. I take a literal view. Many of you know this of the book of Revelation. Before the day of the Lord happens, gang, because the Bible tells us that we were not, that the Lord has no interest in us going through wrath, but, but for salvation. We're not destined for wrath. The church is going to be pulled out. And there are numerous passages that talk about the rapture of the church. Maybe we can do that on a Sunday not too far in the distance. To try and understand what exactly that means. But the indication is that believers in Jesus will be pulled out before the day of the Lord. So if, if the pullout from Gaza in 2005 was Israel's abandoning Gaza... And the day of the Lord is going to happen at any point immediately following that. What does that tell you? The rapture is close. The time is at hand. It could be any time. As I said earlier, unless I just keep going, it could happen before I'm done this morning. It could be tonight. It could be next week. Oh, Rick, I heard one of your prophecy updates three years ago and you said the same thing. I meant it then. But even more so now. Because we see these things churning and burning all around us. <laughs> when Ariel Sharon brought up the idea of the unilateral pull out of Gaza in 2005. Listen to this. Fourteen members of his security cabinet agreed. Seven said, no, don't do it. In the Israeli Knesset... 80, 66, sorry, 66% said no. No. I'm going to get this all messed up. Let me start over. In the Knesset, which is the ruling body there in, in Israel, 66% said pull out, let Gaza go. 33% said don't do it, don't do it. The citizenry of Israel was polled in 2005. 66% of Israel said pull out. 33% said, don't do it. Do the math. The security cabinet, the Knesset, the citizens, across the board, two-thirds of Israel said, abandon Gaza. And one-third said, don't do it. Two-thirds said, pull out of this land that God gave us. God promised it to Israel. Abandon it. It's nothing but heartache, problems, difficulty. Let it go. One-third said, don't give up that land. It is ours in perpetuity. It is ours from the day the Lord gave it to us through Joshua. And in the book of Zechariah, chapter 13, verse 8, it says, it will come about in all the land, declares the Lord, that two parts in it will be cut off and perish, and one-third will be left. 
And I will bring the third part through the fire and refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say they are my people and they will say the Lord is my God. Is that a coincidence? Maybe. Possibly. I'm not going to stake my faith on it. But it was two thirds of Israel who said abandon Gaza. And it was one third of Israel said no. Don't abandon the promise of the land that belongs to Israel. What are you saying, Rick? I'm saying things are falling in line, gang. And if I look at the signs of the time with discernment, I see a red sky at morning. I see the day of the Lord coming. Oh, so, and this was something else in that article, the, the, the USA Today one. The, the guy said, you know, you Christians, you just want to get out. You just want your little rapture thing so you can take off and leave the rest of us with despair and wrath and turmoil. No, we don't. Yes, we want to get out, but we want you to come with us, see? We want to all go with Jesus. We don't want anybody to miss salvation. The compassion of the Christian heart, as born and nurtured by Jesus Christ himself, is nobody should be lost. And so this afternoon, gang, a few of you have some phone calls to make. And I'm not trying to hype you up. I'm trying to stir you up by way of reminder that whether it's today or in a month or in 50 years, the day of the Lord is soon approaching. And there are people we know who don't know. And who need to know. Which is why we look at the signs of the times. Not to be afraid, not to be paranoid or panicky, but to say, wow, stuff is going on here. And it's very close. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they come to Jesus, clinging to their times, lacking any discernment about what was going on. The fact that Messiah was right there, they could not see it. Absolutely blind to the signs of the times, blind to the teachings and the work of Jesus Christ. But worse, worse, Jesus called their teaching leaven. That picture in Scripture, again, of evil throughout. It's how evil permeates and spreads through things. That, that's what leaven is, is used as a picture of. That's why, why the Lord said, hey, when you have the Passover meal, you eat that bread that's unleavened. That's why in the keeping of, of Jewish holidays, the idea of unleavened bread is getting the sin out. And Jesus says the teaching of these guys, of Pharisees and Sadducees, is legend leaven. Well, what did they teach? The Pharisees were legalists. They were so intent on the minutia of the law and especially the oral tradition of their rabbis, which was considered just as weighty as the law itself. They were so into the nitpicking of, of, of what you ate and how you washed and how you walked and what you did each day and how you celebrated Sabbath and how you kept these things of the Lord, of their self-righteousness, that they were blind to the truth of who Messiah was and they didn't see him right before their eyes. The Sadducees, on the other hand, believed in the first five books, the Torah, only, as a history. They did not believe there was ever going to be or would be a resurrection. They didn't believe in the supernatural and the miracles. They were so filled with unbelief that when Jesus comes across performing these miraculous signs, they just explained it all away. Oh, there's got to be a reason for that, you know, walking on the water. He was just walking in the shallows, you know. There has to be a reason for it, so the Sadducees missed it. The legalists and the liberals, Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they denied the truth and they denied the proof, but worse yet, their teaching permeated all of Israel so that the nation itself rejected Christ their Messiah. And there's a sign of the times right there, gang. The refusal of sound doctrine in the church today. And it concerns me greatly. Paul said to Timothy, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. And then he said these words, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they'll accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. And it's, it's my heart's desire that this fellowship is so schooled in the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ that no leaven can seep into this dough. That this be a lump of dough that is leaven free. That it just takes God at his word. Now you might say, well, what's the big concern, Rick? Are you afraid that the truth, your truth, as it's been called to me recently, are you afraid your truth won't stand? No. I know this truth is going to stand. 
I have no doubt whatsoever. I'm not afraid of that. I am concerned when God's people don't stand on the whole truth of the Word of God. That was the Pharisees and the Sadducees. That was their problem. Oh, I see the little ones coming back. Okay, i got to hurry. <laughs> but here's the thing. I don't just hope that you're all informed. Able to sit down with your friends and go, let me talk to you about Zephaniah. You know? That's not the issue here. The issue is, if we don't stand on the whole truth of God's Word, we will miss out on blessing. We will miss out on what God has gifted to us. On what the Lord has given us. Listen closely. Gaza may seem insignificant. And public opinion in Israel in 2005 said, you know what, that little 25 mile long, 7 mile wide strip of land is not worth the pain. Let it go. Just let it go. But it was a gift from God. It was God's gift to the people. It was His to give. It was not theirs to abandon. And Zephaniah 2.4 says they abandoned. Gaza will be abandoned. Given up. Well, just, you know, just let it go. Two-thirds would protest. We've got to let it go. It's just too hard to hold on to. It's too, it's too much of a pain. It's too much of an irritant. It's too dangerous. Just let them have it. It's just Gaza. <clears throat> But our Father doesn't want us to miss out on a single little strip of blessing. Not even something you think might be insignificant. Gang, here's what I'm saying we need to be a people who do. Understanding Israel and all this stuff. Understanding, obviously, the signs of the times. But personally, listen. Personally. Are you giving God authority over your Gaza? What is that little strip of land in your life that you have abandoned for the enemy. I'm going to abandon this aspect of who I am to the enemy because your grace is so big. He got the rest of me, you know. But this little strip, it's just too difficult. It's too much to deal with. It's it's too painful. What is your Gaza? No matter how hard it may be or may seem to hold on to the blessings of God that He gives you, don't let go. Do not let go of any inch. Don't, don't give an inch. Les uses the phrase taking turf. Do not give up turf to the enemy in your life. I go to church every Sunday and every Wednesday. So what if I have a website I like to visit on occasion that's offensive? I read the Bible almost every day. So what if I enjoy Family Guy? The show. (laughs) So what if I cave when it comes to certain movies? Or or if I cave when it comes to hanging out in certain bars? Or if I cave when it comes to... It's just a little strip. It's not a big deal. It's just Gaza. The enemy's already there. Just abandon that. Don't give it up. My understanding of Zephaniah's words are correct. Part of the reason of the day of the Lord. A small part, but part, is the abandonment of Gaza. Is the people of Israel saying, we're not going to accept or receive all of the promises of God. And the day of the Lord is coming. It has been prophesied about. It has been indicated we have very, very clear and definite signs of the times. By the, by the way, gentlemen, guys, what I'm talking about right now is authentic manhood. Authentic manhood is not giving place to the enemy anywhere. In your past, your present, your future, your behaviors, your attitudes, your marriage, your family, your fatherhood, your sonship, none of it. You don't give place to the enemy. That is an authentic man. And that's the journey we guys are on. And by the way, any of you guys who haven't joined us, come along. It's good stuff. It's good stuff. One more verse. Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, Not that I have already obtained it, or have already become perfect, 
But I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Jesus Christ. When we studied Joshua, that's what we talked about. Taking the land. Not part of the land. Not a piece of the land. The whole thing. Take hold of the promises of God. Paul says, brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Listen, there are some of you right now who would say, I've already abandoned Gaza. The enemy already has too strong a foothold there. I can't deal with that anymore. Listen to what Paul said. Forget what lies behind and press on. And roll those tanks back into Gaza and take it back as your land. I'm speaking spiritually. What Israel does, they're going to have to answer for, as the Lord said, would happen. I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, we ask you to come back in and reign in authority and control over the Gaza in each one of our lives. I don't even need to guess at what it is for each of us. We all have different areas that we've caved, we've given in to the enemy, we have allowed the enemy to reside and to sit and to stay. Jesus, I pray that you would come in powerfully, your spirit like a flood, and clean out that aspect of this bride. May we be spotless and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Convict us, Father, where we need conviction. Not out of guilt and condemnation, Lord, but conviction. May we, as as children of our Father, know that we can come to You and confess every aspect of our sin and be forgiven and be freed and, and receive grace. May we, at the same time, turn around and be people who give grace. First of all, to each other in this fellowship. But secondly, Father, people who bring grace to a world that, like a juggernaut, is spiraling out of control. Lord, I know the day of the Lord is coming. I know that time of wrath, of your indignation, will be poured out. And so, Father, motivate, convict, and challenge us to be lights in a darkening world. And though the sky may be red this morning and the storm is coming, we know greater than that, Jesus Christ is coming. And we look forward to that glorious day. In Jesus' name, amen.